Hey, what's up, Reefers? Yes, I will be leaving YouTube for just a little bit. So if you actually watched to the end of last video, you noticed that I actually proposed to Emily at the Tidal Basin during the cherry blossom season, which was like two weeks ago. And her answer? Yes. Thankfully. It did take a little convincing though because it was April Fool's Day. I just picked the perfect day to do this, right? Anyways, we are on the fast track and the wedding is actually happening April 28th. We've actually been talking about this for a while, so we actually planned the wedding before I even proposed. So going into the proposal, you can say that I was pretty confident. Either way, I just feel so happy and so blessed to have her in my life. I mean, who could complain about a free camera woman working for you the entire time? Yes. Not to mention the clickbait potential. Woo! All joking aside, I love you, Emily. I'm really glad that I get to spend the rest of my life with you. This is a dream come true. Okay, in love of the sappy stuff. So what is this video about? As we get closer and closer to the date, there's just more and more stuff to do, and I realized that there's no way I could keep doing YouTube videos while planning for the wedding. So after this video, I'm just gonna pause on YouTube and just focus completely on the wedding, which is gonna happen in what? two and a half weeks, actually two weeks by the time you're watching this, which is insane. But before I leave you, I just want to make this huge, humongous update for you all, talking about all my fish tank. We're gonna start off with the 45 gallon reef tank, and then the 9 gallon planter tank, followed by the 40 gallon breeder axolotl tank, and finally, to cap it off at the 10 gallon nano tank. And a lot has changed in every single one of these tanks. So I hope that you find them interesting. And I also apologize in advance because this video is gonna be long. So feel free to stretch it out. Just watch a piece of it every Sunday. And I'll be back the first weekend of May or the second weekend of May, depending on how things go. In the meantime though, I'm gonna keep up with my Instagram account. So if you have not already, be sure to follow me at Inappropriate Reefer because Instagram is so much easier to make updates versus like a YouTube video here. So without further ado, please enjoy this longest update I have ever done. Flashback. All right, we first, let's talk about the 45 gallon tank. This is the final update until I became a married man. Now, where shall we start? Let's talk about the fish first. I have not talked about my pair of clowns in a long time, so let's start with them. So this is a pair of Mocha Da Vinci clowns from Sea and Reef that I got from Blue Ribbon Koi maybe like four and a half years ago, four years ago. Um, they have been with me for a while, obviously. Uh, the male has been growing considerably this last year, but they have not laid any eggs yet, so I'm kind of crossing my fingers. It's been a while. Come on guys, get to work. Now the Ross is the silver belly Ross that I am mistaken as a yellow coarse Ross. It grew a little bit, but for the most part, it is one of the most active fish in this tank. I always find it kind of picking at things, picking at rock worse. Uh, I'm pretty sure she's picking off of um, copepods. And again, his name is Kramer. Switching gear over to the uh, the file fish right here. These are the red, red isle file fish from Life Aquarium. I found them on Divers Den. I've always wanted to keep a pair of them because they are known to have a symbiotic relationship with Xenia. That's this guy right here. However, I have not seen them in the Xenia at all. So I got a pair of them. Let's see, one of them is here. Where's the other one? Usually it hangs out in the back when it's not front. Hmm. I actually do not know where he is at the moment. Oh, there he is, right there. So they're supposed to be a pair. However, I think they kind of hate each other. Well, I'll, I'll see them chase each other once in a while. Uh, this is a smaller person, smaller guy, and that's a bigger one back there. They actually seem to really like the Gorgonian back here. Uh, that's a Grubs Gorgonian that I can talk about a little bit later. Now, besides these fish, we also got, let's see, in the back, we'll see the Yasha Gobi. That's a female. As you, as you remember, uh, sorry it's a little far away so it's hard to see, but a female had a nipped top fin before, but it has really grown back. We'll see if she moves to this entrance of her burrow, and uh, so we can get a better look at her. But the pair has been doing really well, they're still paired up, they still live in the same barrel. The barrel just have two entrants, and the pistol shrimp has been super happy uh, keeping the barrel upgraded. Okay. So with the fish out of the way, let's, talk, let's start talking about the inverts. First thing first, the rose bubble pip anemone has really gotten large. It's about a quarter of this tank size, if you look right here. Uh, I wish I can show you guys from the top down, but the wave maker is on, so it's kind of hard to see. But it takes up almost a quarter of this tank, so it is totally the centerpiece. And it is 
torching everything <laughs> on that side of the tank. Look at the red Monty cap right there. See how it's all bleached out? The part where the anemone is touching? The anemone is not touching there before, but since it has really grown in size and started reaching out further, it started torching everything over there. But I just decided to leave it. it. It is what it is. And it is encroaching on the green SPS right here. I can't pronounce it, I'm not gonna try. But you know what? That anemone is kind of like the centerpiece of the tank, so I just kind of left it alone. Now, the second invert that a lot of people are interested in is the Derisa clam. This is the $50 Peco clam. Same clam, still doing well. If you look at the shell, although the, the I was having some elk swing, so the growth has slowed a little bit, but it does have somewhat of a blue ring indicating the shell has been de developing. So it is still happy and well. We got the little clam in the back. That is a hybrid Derisa slash Squamosa clam that I got at a WAMAS meeting from Pacific East Agriculture. Uh, for a while, it had a pinch mental at the far side and that got me really nervous because a lot of clams do not come back from pinch mentals. But thankfully, it, that it healed itself and then it started developing nicer color. So if you kind of look at the mentals, uh, besides the purple spot, the the metal the brown seems to have like a green tint to it now so hopefully it'll turn um, a more vibrant color as it gets a little bit larger coming over here we got the star of this tank everybody's favorite aptasia bob bob has been doing fantastic every time i feed the tank i don't know how but he was always able to grab a fish flake i don't know how uh, but once in a while, you see Bob will drop some clones down here. We see some babies right here. But these babies never last more than a couple days. I am not sure what is picking them off. My suspicion is the file fish. But the baby will always disappear, uh, but Bob is never touched. So I feel like Bob may be a little bit too large for the file fish, assuming it is file fish picking them off, for the file fish to pick on. But for the most part, all the babies do not really affect the tank. Now let's talk about corals a little bit since we are in this corner. Let's start over here. Sorry, this is gonna be a long one. <laughs> so the blue cloves, I'm actually really glad that the blue cloves is doing really well. To a lot of people, the blue cloves is actually a pest coral. But to me, I feel like they look beautiful. Um, and there's they started out as a little frag. They have been bouncing over the tank. I started over there, it got torched by the anemone. And then I moved them over here. I think they got squeezed out by the zoas. And then eventually some of them landed here and started growing on the sand bed itself. This is actually on the sand bed. And they started spreading a little bit. So I may move a little bit over there to see if it will start colonizing this rock. Because for me, this rock is kind of like, a, uh, I want a zinnia to grow there. I just want things to grow there. These are all soft coral, so they can just, fight for territory they can do their thing now the xenia is really interesting because like sometimes they pulse sometimes they not they're not and i'm trying to figure out what it is like is it the ph is it the light is it the nutrient level a lot of people say that if the flow is low they will start pulsing uh, but at the same time but in my experience the flow has been consistent here yet sometimes they fl uh, sometimes they pulse and sometimes they do not um one really interesting theory that was brought up is that maybe when the water is really nutrient rich, they do not pulse. Because the water is so nutrient rich that they do not need to pulse to get the nutrient to absorb the nutrient or get the nutrient into the mouth or whatnot. But when there's not enough nutrient, they'll actually pulse to get the water to flow through the polyps so they can absorb the nutrient. So that kind of makes sense. So maybe when it's pulsing, nutrient level is low. I don't know. I'll experiment with that a little bit later. Sliding over here, uh, we got my little Aiken garden that I started. The Aiken uh, finally doing well. Uh, for a stretch of time, I was having a lot of trouble with Aikens, but it seems like the, wa the water of this tank is stable enough that Aiken is doing well one more time. Now, while we're here, that's one thing I really want to point out. I used to have a tiny frag of King Midas that has been doing really well here, but today it disappeared. And what I found is that right above it, there's actually an Estria star. It's really hard to see because I can't really zoom in. But there's an Estria star right next to it. So I was like, hold on a second. I hear that sometimes Estria stars, Asturina star, I think that's a proper pronunciation, they eat zoas. 
So I posted a picture of it online and a lot of people chime in saying that yes, um, certain strands of those starfish will actually eat zoas. And one person pointed out that, okay, the purple type, right, with black marking, they, they are the strand that may eat zoas. So that's what I'm looking at right here. Uh, later on, I posted a macro shot of this and somebody who seems to know what he's talking about said that this is actually not Escherina starfish, it's a different type. And they're not, there's no documents saying that they actually eat zoas. However, uh, from a lot of reefers antidote, these type of uh, starfish may actually eat zoas, at least like in, um, in, in the experience, in the reefers experience. They've seen this strand eat zoa as well, although it's not scientifically proven. So I, I'm gonna pull it. <laughs> I'm gonna pull it out just to be safe. However, this is the first time I'm having trouble with this kind of starfish. Usually I leave them alone um, and I have no disappearing zoas, but this is a little bit too close for comfort. Um, however, if it's not the starfish, then it's most likely the filefish because I hear that the filefish sometimes do go rogue and start picking up zoas. So I'm keeping my eyes, eyes out. But that is one of the uh, big update in this tank. Now, whew, let me breathe. What are you doing? <laughs> now the other thing I'm really happy about of this tank is the SPS. So I've not been super confident in terms of SPS keeping um, in my reef tanks because like I feel like my tanks always in flux. However, recently the tank has been really stable and doing really well. Um, check it out. The Monty cap on the back wall has seriously taken off. Started laying, layering, and then started cupping forward. Same thing with the green Monty cap in the back. Now the danger now is that there's no space between the Monty cap and the rose bubble tip anemone in the back. So at some point, the rose bubble tip anemone is gonna burn the tip of the um, the edge of the Monty cap. But that's just the way it is. I don't think I can really break that part off without breaking the whole thing. So we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. But that is doing well. This Monty cap is doing well over here as well. Also, that green SPS and the potato chip coral uh, up front is doing really well as well. And a fun one is actually, if you look at the frac, frac rack, that is actually a pink Monty digitata. And just been growing onto the frac rack and doing well. So for the most part, SPS seems to be liking the um, the tank parameter these days, so that gives me a little bit more confidence. So I may try a little bit more SPS uh, when I get back into the swing of things. Oh, look at this, guys. Here is the male Yasha Gobi. Take a look at the top fin. Look at how tall, how long it is. That's ridiculous. Let's see if the female comes and join him on this side as well. But right behind him, you see this huge finger letter that I picked up from a WAMAS member a while back. I think it was for like $60. It's really, it's really cheap, really affordable. And I thought it would create some nice uh, texture and form in the back of the tank. So it's not just like a bare wall. And I feel like it's really filling in. However, it's really squeezing out the grubs um, Gorgonian. One, one fun thing is that that piece right there in the back on the frack rack, I did not place it there. It just kind of like, I guess like a piece fell off and kind of stuck over there and started growing under the glass. It's actually growing off of the glass, so that's kind of cool. All right, guys, and I think, oh, by the way, Fathead Andro's in the back. It's kind of covered up by the clam, can't see it, but it's still there. I'll show you guys from here. And it's spawning some new babies, if you can see it right there. And, oh, I forgot, to, there's, there's a piss of shrimp, look at that. Sorry, I got like ADHD. Uh, and I co really cool, Christmas tree worm rock is still here, yeah. Uh, and a really cool thing is that this forest fire digitata, if you have been watching this channel for a while, you know that digitata has been in the tank for about a year and a half now. And I've been hating life for a long time. Pile up is tiny. Uh, the whole thing looks bleached. But recently it has really, really bounced back. Look at how the pile up is. And it's already encrusted onto the glass. So this just give me a lot of confidence in terms of keeping SPS in this tank. All right, guys, I'm sorry I spent so much time on this tank, but this is seriously like my, <laughs> my, my love and joy. Um, just having so much fun with this. But for the most part, I noticed that the less I put my hand into the tank, the better the tank does. So, huh, I'm really curious how keeping my hands out of this tank for the next three or four weeks will do in terms of coral growth. I feel like that's gonna be a little bit, a little uh, jousting for space in this tank. 
but for the most part I think the tank is gonna look a lot more grown in and mature and I can't wait to see how it does. All right guys, moving on to the next tank. The next day. All right, reverse. The second tank I want to share is the 40 gallon breeder tank that houses two Exilado and a couple fish. This tank is a source of frustration, but also a source of encouragement. So let's check it out. Now, first of all, let's talk about the main characters in this tank. Number one is this Exilado right here. And the other one, as always, is hiding. You see, you see, you see her in, inside the trunk of this branch. Yeah, so that's the difference between these two guys or girls. Uh, this one is usually always out and about. The other one likes to hide whether it's in the branch or in the back and stuff like that and really only come out when the light is totally off. So she is really sensitive to light and, uh, and just don't like interaction as much compared to this little girl right here. Now, I mentioned that this tank is a combination of frustration as well as encouragement. Uh, whew, where do I even begin? So this is like a huge experimental tank because typically with Exolados, a lot of people like to keep them with bare tanks and almost like no plants for a really good reason. So I thought, okay, well, is there some kind of elements from a planted tank that I can carry over here while the setup still remains safe for Exolado? So this tank has been up for a couple months and so far things are going somewhat well. <laughs> I mean somewhat because some plants did really well and some plants just kind of per perished. But the Exolado, both of them are healthy and continue to grow. And if you check, all the little gills are all intact. Now this is one source of my concern as well. Because as you see here, we got some fish with the Exolado. Uh, even though through my, through my research, I understand the white cloud minnows is, um, should be safe with Exolado. But once in a while, people still say that, hey, you shouldn't keep any fish except Exolado. So I've been keeping a really close eyes on them. And of course, the Exolado, if they could get their little mouth on the fish, will consume the fish for a meal. And I started out with seven of these guys, and now I only have two. So either one of the Exolado or both of them probably caught some fish and had them as a meal. But that was part of the plan as well. Um, these are quote unquote my disposable tank mates for the Exolado, similar to Damsos in the Frogfish tank. Um, look at that. But these two has really gotten smart. They know the distance they could keep away from Exolado without being eaten and that's why they lasted so long. And same thing with an Amber Tetra, this little guy right here. Now this guy actually started out in the 20 gallon long tank with the Exolado and it survived all the way to now. So they, they are almost a year old, this little guy right here. And somehow they found ways to coexist with the Exolado. Look, dude, look at, look at her. What is she doing? She's stuck. Now let's talk about the plants. Plants is something that I have really gotten into, uh, I think later part of last year. So when I had a chance to set up a larger tank like this, a 40 gallon breeder, uh, it's cold water. I figured, okay, well, let's try some plants. Plants to me really make sense here because like number one, it provides shading for Exolado. As you know, they're really sensitive to lights. That's why I really focus on these floating uh, floating plants because I feel like uh, they'll cover up the lights. So the light do not really hit the tank as hard versus like a, uh, open top. And the second thing about plants I really like is that they take up the nutrient in the water because Exolado is pretty messy. They eat, they eat like worms and stuff like that and their poop is like this big. And because the substrate is brown, sometimes the poop is a little bit hard to spot. Um, not to mention I have a lot of crevices, right? So I may not be able to find all the poop as they go uh, in the tank. And that's when I rely on the fish, on the shrimp. That's actually a couple of cherry shrimps in here as well to kind of pick apart the poop and as, as well as the plant to kind of uh, uptake the nutrient. And I want to really quickly go over the plants that I have in this tank and how have, they've been doing in this cold water tank. Now, in terms of substrate, we have to talk about substrate before we go into the plant. I'm using the uh, Contra Soil powder form. This is the powder form. And they have been working really well. There was no ammonia spike and there's no issue with the Exolado eating the soil. Um, a couple times I saw them kind of bite into it. They immediately spit it back out, no issue. And also this soil is so soft. If you kind of just like rub them against your finger, they just kind of break apart into mud. So really, I honestly don't think there's much of a risk of um, impacting because like a lot of times some people may use little gravels. That's really bad for Exolado because if they ingest it, it may block the intestine and that's a big no-no. So these seems to be okay. However, it is still early, so I'm keeping my eyes out and this is only my experience, so be sure to do your research as well. Okay, sorry. 
onwards to the plants. A couple plants that have been doing really well um, are these Amazon Sword. It looks kind of blah, crappy right now, but they actually have grown. The one that has been doing super well is actually that, uh, I think it's called St. Elmo Sword in the back right here. It's doing so well that it's actually shooting out. It got like a, um, a branch that kind of reached the top and the leaves actually changed to these kind of narrow long leaves format versus the um, rounded broad ones down here. And I think it's like almost trying to flower or something like that. So I need to like cut this off so I encourage it to grow sideways. Uh, the Anubias are doing okay. They're really slow growing. Oh, dude, actually, you know what? I just spotted that. Actually, no, you know what? I think that's just like a piece that floated off. But that's the Anubius, um, that's the Dwarf Golden or the Golden Anubius. And these are the Nala, I believe. These are the really small ones. They're really slow growing, but as you can see, the roots are really starting to grow onto the driftwood. But the, again, these are really slow growing. Now, onto the stem plants right here. These are doing, they've been holding steady. It's just recently it started growing a little bit. Same thing with that one. Um, I tried two or three other types of stem plants from my nine gallon tank and it just perished really quickly. But these two type has been holding on. I believe these are the micro sword right here. They're just kind of like holding on. They're not, they're receding a little bit. But one interesting thing is that I'm actually noticing some really tiny new growth right there as well. So I'm kind of holding my breath. And in the last update, we talked about the Monte Carlos and I pretty much just kind of written them off because they all just kind of melted away. I planted a lot, they all just melted away. But this week, I noticed that if you look right here, this is one of the only colony left, actually two, one here and one here. That's actually new growth coming out. I was really surprised. I did not spot this at all. I just kind of written them off. But it seems like two little crumb kind of established themselves somehow and they started popping out, so I'm really, really excited about it. And it seems like the Exolado really stopped digging around this area. Before they were kind of like running, well, they still do, they kind of run tracks around the outer perimeter of this tank. Um, so I guess they kind of left that area alone and the plants was able to establish itself a little bit. I think those are repents. I'm slowly learning the name. They're kind of holding steady. They haven't really started growing. And I think that's actually what it was right there. And maybe just one large piece got kind of ripped up and just floated up there. Um, they're just holding steady. I wouldn't say they're successful or failing yet. They're just kind of holding steady, trying to establish themselves. I'm hoping that given time, they will kind of find a footing and start growing growing out like these uh, Monte Carlos. Uh, so that's another really interesting thing I just noticed today. I have one red tiger lotus actually two in this area, but they just kind of perish after about two weeks. It just did not do well at all. But if you look really carefully right there, there's actually a new leaf sprouting. I just saw this today. I was so excited. I was like, dude, what's going on? So that's doing well. And of course we got a moss ball right here. This is actually for a special project. I did not intend to keep this in this tank long-term, but the Axolotl actually seems to enjoy kind of playing with this. It's kind of crazy, but they do kind of like to push them around intentionally or unintentionally, they do kind of move it around. And I'm all about um, enrichment for the animals, whether it's intentionally or not. So I may end up adding a couple more moss ball in here uh, because I, I do feel like it's something different, something a little bit more for the Exolado to do versus just kind of like sitting there. Uh, so that's really cool. And you may notice there's a lot of these like fine algae growing right here. And these are like really fine hair algae. Um, whenever I do a water change um, at the end of the week, I'll suck up a lot of these. And that just tells me that there's a lot of excess nutrient. The plant is not really taking out all the um, nutrient and the water change I do is probably not enough. So what I plan to do, well, I'm not gonna step up the water change because I feel like once a week is good enough. Um, I'm gonna try to plant moss uh, one reason I feel like these stem plants may not be doing as well as it could be is because a lot of these light got filtered out or blocked off by the floating plants. So I think maybe moss or even java fern maybe may do well because they don't need as much light. But I really like some of the moss. Some of them look really impressive. So I may start tying up some moss to the branch and see if it'll help with coverage as well as using up the excess nutrient that I'm, I'm guessing I have. That's why I have algae grown. Moving on to the floating plants. I really, really like the floating plants. Um, sometimes they get to be a pain to hold them back because they grow so well in this tank. These are some of my favorite. These are the red root floaters. Um, they just make such beautiful foreground plants. Look at that. Usually a lot of people pay, a lot of people pay attention to the uh, bottom right here, but since the axolotl will move around and kind of pull up the some of the 
bottom plants if they're not kind of stash out in a uh, thoughtful way, which that's why I lost all a bunch of these because they kept being pulled up. Um, so it's especially nice to have like beautiful floating plants in an axolotl tank. So red root floaters. These are one of my favorite floating plants right now. And they just reproduce so fast as well. They're doing really well. They reproduce like this and they kind of branches off, they break off. And back here, we got the water sprites. Let me see. And these are, oh, I just broke one off. These are really, really, they got them really heavy. Look at the roots. And if you look here, it gives that awesome jungly look, especially with the algae growing on it. So this is a part where I don't mind algae growth. It just looks, it, it got give that like wow look, which I really like. It's almost like a jungle or a swamp. And to keep these two type of plants separate, I have a fishing wire or fishing line right here. If you see right here, attach a suction cup. Initially I did this um, so that plants can get sucked into the filter intake right there. But now that the plants has really grown to a massive, well, I wouldn't say massive, but a larger size, they don't get pushed down by the water flow as much or as easily. Um, so this also, this more works as a uh, separator between the two type of plants because I want to keep the shorter plants up front, the, that's a redwood floaters, and the longer plants in the back, the water sprite. So I get, even at the top, we got some foreground and then we got some background. Now continue moving towards the back, we got these household plants. These are porphos. Initially, I added this for nutrient uptake because these are excellent, excellent for nutrient uptake in a fish tank. If I experience like terrible algae issues in a freshwater tank, you should just shove a porpho in there to help out. And as you can see, the root system just kind of took over the AquaClear 30 filter in the back tremendously. And the root started out at just at the top of the water surface and now it's kind of all the way reaching the bottom and is really growing into a more complex root system. I can't wait for those root system to kind of like branch out, grab onto the back and start crawling all over the place. And I'll probably try to plant some moss on there. I think it's gonna look fantastic. And look, it used to be like this long. That's why there was um, that clip right there. In the last three months or so, it, can, it grew all the way up here already. And these are some decent sized leaves like this. Look at this. And Emily just kind of like, are you done yet? <laughs> oh, look, at, look at these. So this is awesome. Now looking over here, you may be wondering, what is this? So look right here. We got a sweet potato. Now I got this idea. <laughs> I got this idea. You stole it from my kitchen. I stole this from my kitchen because, right like, there. man, somebody from Instagram left a comment. It's like, dude, you should check out. Um, uh, you should check out this. Uh, I think it's Mark Shrimps. Uh, Mark's Aquatics. Um, he got a video. Um, Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong left a left a comment saying that you should check out Mark's uh, Mark's Aquatics. I think I think that's the channel name. I apologize if I got it wrong, um, but he apparently sprouted. Um, a sweet potato and the root system looks amazing with the plants. The leaves look fantastic. But uh, so I have this in in, <laughs> in the uh, hang on the back filter for about two weeks already. It's not sprouting. No, it's not sprouting. So some people are saying that some of these potato got spray a certain chemical or something like that that um, that prevents it from sprouting. It discourages it from sprouting. So it may not sprout or it may take a while. Maybe, maybe, but check out the root system of the pulfos in there. But uh, I'm, I'm still kind of holding, holding out hopes for this guy, so I'm gonna put him back in here. Or maybe it needs to be in deeper water. Maybe it's like it should be this deep. I don't know. We'll see. I, I'll, I'll mess with this um, after the wedding when I have a little more time. For now, I'm just gonna let the system run and we'll, oh, we'll see how it goes. I, yeah, I'm, I'm getting worried. Are you coming to my wedding? You're getting worried or married. Married. <laughs> I'm getting worried. But here's another look from the top as well. So in terms of feeding the axolotl, um, I feed them like two of those like red regular worms uh, every other day or every three days or so. And um, yeah, two worms per axolotl and they seem to be doing well. Yeah. Happy little fellas. Look, look, look at her, like moving her gill back there. All right guys, so that is the update for the axolotl tank. Let's move on to which tank should we do next? How about, since we're doing fresh water, let's do the nine gallon planted tank. Hey, what's up, reefers? Let's talk about the nine gallon planted tank. So this tank went through some serious ups and downs in the past two months, namely because the CO2 canister 
ran out and I could not find a refill for about two weeks. And during that period of time, Stackhorn algae, um, black beer algae just completely took over the tank. And as you can see, we still have some remnants of the, um, well, this, I think there's just regular algae now, not so much the black beard. Um, so to treat the black beard algae, I have been dosing Excel, and also I target, um, target treats troublesome spot with hydrogen peroxide and they, they do work well. After a couple of days, the algae just kind of turn pink and eventually disappear. Now, you see this little guy right here. So that's a Siamese algae eater. Uh, they are in the carp family, so they do get to a decent size. But I found um, actually two baby ones and the plan is for them to help with algae control and once they get to a certain size, I'll just give them away um, and maybe treat, uh, tra trade it in for smaller ones um, if I still have algae issue. But for the most part, I think the algae is gone. Well, not gone, but really um, back under control. Uh, once I got the CO2 back pumping and we got the plants growing again. And the plants do grow quite fast now with the CO2 back into back in operating uh, order. Dude, look at this. These narrate snails, man, they're crazy. They like to uh, crawl out of the water, I think to lay eggs or something like that. And then they'll, I'll just randomly find them on the floor or like on the countertop. And I'll just kind of drop them back in the tank. There you go. <laughs> it's gonna come back out again. But I think the main characters of this tank are these little cherry shrimps right here. We started out with about five or six of these larger cherry shrimps and then over time they just kind of reproduce and now I have a lot of baby shrimps. And then I find that if I just kind of like run the nets, run the nets through the, um, the plants, a bunch of babies will pop out. For example, right there, there's one of them. See, see that guy right there? Cool, huh? Yeah, right, there's a couple over there as well. And once in a while, we'll find some wild types. Those are the ones that, that's clear, like that one right there. And oh, oh, this one right here is uh, right there. So typically, I think like um, people who really care about color, they'll call them, meaning that they'll just kind of like um, discard them somewhere or give them away or something like that. Uh, I have been just dropping these uh, once they get to a certain size into the Exolado tank. And some of them actually do quite well in the tank. And I actually found quite a few red ones. So it seems like I had to color it up or something happened. I don't know what happened, but we got some nice cherry shrimps in the Exolado tank as well. So that's awesome to see. Now in this tank, there's also six celestial pearl daniels. But whenever the plants get a little bit more dense, it's just really hard to spark them. And they only come out during feeding time. Um, and today I, I actually just saw one, which is, I don't know. It's, uh, sometimes I was like, did they all die? And then once in a while you see all six of them. They're like, oh, nope, they're just kind of hiding and doing whatever they do in, inside the plants. And I, I used to pride myself on having really outgoing celestial pearl daniel in this tank, if you look at the older videos. But they are definitely proving me wrong. They are as elusive as everybody says. Maybe back then I just did not have enough um, coverage for them to kind of hide and stuff like that. But I do have six. I do have six. Once in a while I see them all hang out. And in front we got two little cor pygmy quarry cats right there. Like cute little dudes. I really enjoy watching them hanging out and just dart up to the surface, come back down. And, and they like to kind of hang out with the Siamese algae eaters you can see right here. Maybe it's because they all have like a stripe. So, I don't know, birds of the feather? I don't know. They seem to be kind of chilling. Look at that, just like that. And they follow each other. That's the cutest little thing, isn't it? Look at that. And they really seem to like that little open spot right here. Let me explain that spot right here a little bit. Um, at some point, the dwarf baby tear has, was doing really well, but at the same time, it's gotten entangled with a lot of those, um, I think it's called like, uh, it's those uh, it's bud wart or something like that. It's those carnivorous plants. And um, whenever I pull those out, I will lift up a section of the carpet. So I think like I did not trim it back enough. So it started lifting off. And as, at, at that point, I'm just like, oh, you know what, forget it. So I just kind of trimmed the whole thing off, the pieces that are lifting up. So we got this bare spot right here that I hope that the dwarf will grow into. Um, but so far, the catfish seems to really like hanging out here. Probably because they can access the substrate directly and it's easy on the little, um, uh, what, what do you call it? Those like feelers around the mouth. So they've been really happy with this little spot. So I may just leave it bare for those guys. In terms of plants, I don't know any of the names, man. But these, uh, I mean, these are doing really well, but they, they're just growing really ugly. So I may just pull it all out at some point. 
this plant, I planted some in the Exolado tank and it has been doing really well in there as well. But I, and I really like the shape. You see how it's like a little cup shape? So I, I like these. These are here to stay. These type right here, they're almost like basil, isn't it? Well, in some way. But I really like the magenta in the back side of the leaves, so I'll, I'll definitely keep them as well. Same thing with these sort. I think these are micro sort. I really like the different, the contrast and form here. And this this has always done well for me, and they always pearl so nice, but now they're kind of growing out of control. I find that I have to trim them back every three or four days, or they're gonna hit the top of the water. It's gonna look really messy. So, um, they usually either look really bushy like it is right now, or they look really short. These guys have been going crazy gangbuster as well, and I just kind of just cut them back as much as I could. Same thing with these guys up front. These have been doing really well. I'm trying, I'm trying my hardest to make sure there's some kind of layer. So the ones up front is really low, and the ones in the back is a little bit more, a little bit taller to create that little slope. But as you can see, I'm failing. They're just growing really fast. So yeah, I mean, usually whenever I get home from work, um, I'll just kind of like squat. Well, not squat, but I'll kind of, I'll be like this in front of my tank, like this. And every time maybe like I'm um, waiting for food to get done, I'll just kind of like, like this too. And just watch. Yeah, so this is kind of like my zen. Even more so, even more so this is the land of sky blue water. water. Well, maybe just because it's so small, it's so And of course, Land these are red root floaters, but as you can see, these roots are not as red as the ones in the x tank. Now, from what I understand, I believe the redness of the roots comes from iron in the water. Which makes sense, because there's so many plants in here to compete with uh, the red root floater for nutrients, right? Uh, maybe that's why it's not as red as a lot of nutrients that I'll take by the plants. Um, so, in the x tank, where it's really nutrient heavy, water Shout out to Nano Rocks. Um, I paid for him to uh, create Remember a that commission plan piece I could not tell you that about. cover one side of the. Um, I, I think this is the. Have got to go fast. Outflow. And that's the inflow right there. I commissioned him to do a uh, a piece right there to cover up the outflow, and it looks beautiful, right? I'm trying to recreate the Totoro sleep, sleeping scenes, and right here we got we actually got five cherry shrimps. This is like a teen. This is like a tiny little guy. Look, this is like almost a. Like, it's not even that large. But just look at the size difference. And there are a couple tiny babies in here. And they've been in here for about three weeks already with no issue at all. And um, I'll also do a video on how I sealed, how I aquarium proof uh, figurine that I picked up from Japan. So look forward to that video. That should drop in a couple weeks. All right, guys. I hope you guys have had enough of fresh water because we're going back to salts. Let's take a look at the 10 gallon budget and a reef.
moments later. All right, reverse. Here is the 10 gallon budget nano builds. So in the last video, I mentioned that the little clownfish shark bait went missing. Well, it has been about two weeks and he is still missing. So he is probably a goner, unfortunately. However, one really strange thing started happening with this tank is that all the rolls bubble up the anatomy started to move around as they like playing musical chairs, the oddest thing. So this one actually used to be on that side. It detached, started climbing up the wall right here. I was freaking out because it's getting really close to the intake. But thankfully it kind of made itself down again and then attached there. Now we swing over to the other side. We'll see that the one that Shark Bay stayed in kind of stayed put, it's still there. However, that one over there in the back decided to move over here and it's also really close in intake. This makes me a little nervous. So I think after this video, I'm gonna put on the uh, sponge pre-filter for the intake so that it does not get sucked into it. But for the most part, the uh, roll split anatomy has been really strong in terms of how strong the foot holds to the rock or the glass. So I'm not 100% worried, but to be safe, I'm probably gonna put a sponge filter onto the intake as they're roaming around. Now I'm thinking, I'm thinking like, why did they start moving around? I tested the water parameters and everything seems to be the same. And then I thought of one thing. When I was looking for shark bait, I kind of pulled out all the filter media, cleaned the tank really well. So I think maybe like by cleaning out all the detritus and all the clogs, the filter got a lot stronger like before. So the water flow is a little bit stronger. So the, uh, because I changed the water flow, uh, maybe the anatomy did not like it and started moving around. As noticed, I noticed the um, Bally Mini Max moved a little bit, not as much as the Rose Bubble to Anatomy. They're really hating life. This moved a little bit too. Same thing with the Rock Flower Anatomy that Mighty Nano Tank hooked me up with. It also moved from down here all the way up into the flow a little bit, which is interesting. Now let's talk about the other addition to this tank since the last major update of the Tank Gallon Budget Nano Builds. First of all, you see the green stop polyp. Uh, this came from the 45 gallon tank downstairs. I was taking down the frack rag and the, this SPS was overgrown with the GSP. And I kind of want to introduce the GSP into this tank. So I thought what better way uh, than just moving the SPS frack here onto this rock island. Now I keep it here so that it does not spread over here. Uh, I want to keep it separate in case it goes out of control, which is fine. Now a little bit further down, we got the Grubbs Gorgonian from ORA. Uh, this has been growing really well in the 45 gallon. And I've added this maybe three or four weeks ago and it is starting to open up. And it actually started encrusting a little bit at the base now, so that's fantastic. Sliding over here a little bit, we see a couple Zoas. I added some Zoas here from the 45 gallon tank. The two at the top, one is the Fang Banger, that was from the Wildmass Frag Grow Out Contest. So if you're one of the OG viewers, you may remember, I think a year and a half ago, um, or two years ago now, Wildmass has a Zoa Grow Out Contest and I was part of it. I did not win, but I did get this nice frag. To the left, uh, this is the Grow Out Contest from also Wildmass last year, and I believe that is the Sakura. It's like a nice pink slash purple. Um, also, I did not win, but I did get this nice frag out of it. Uh, so the other ones are the, uh, are the already existing Zoas in this tank. For a while, they were not happy. The sexy shrimps are crawling over them. But ever since I started feeding the sexy shrimp more, I think like the shrimp kind of leave the Zoa alone. Also, they, they tend to start sticking to the rose bubble of anatomy now, now that I've introduced them. Look at that. See right in the middle, there's a sexy shrimp really aggressively going into the rose bubble of anatomy. And they seems to, I don't think the RBTA really likes it. That's why I'm kind of, I'm kind of in a rush to get another clown to keep them out of the bubble of anatomy. Coming over here, I gave away a big chunk of the uh, Pally's, uh, the, the Pandora Pally um, to uh, Yuli, my great friend. And um, I think it's growing well for him. I gotta ask him, I haven't talked to him about his reef tank in a while. But these guys grow super fast. One really interesting thing about them is that if you look at the bottom ones, they look kind of dull. But as they go more towards the light, they take on this fluorescent look that looks quite nice. And that is the look I, I, I was used to when I picked them up from a local vendor. And they slowly fade it uh, when they go into this tank. But as they get a little bit higher up, they start to regain the color. So it's really interesting. Back when I visited Top Shelf Aquatic in Orlando, um, uh, they also mentioned something like this, like based on the water, um, 
the water current, as well as the light intensity, the zoas or the pally really display a different color and comf uh, or the, the morph. Like you see how the tentacle, how long the tentacle is and stuff like that. They really differ and also the, or the size based on where they are. So it's really interesting. Now coming up a little bit, we are looking at the kryptonite candy cane that the whole colony just kind of crashed and I was able to save one of these frags from the 45 to here. Um, this was doing the... Yeah, I'm doing an update. This is the last update. Yeah, give me like... What do you guys think? Maybe like three minutes? We can wrap this up in three minutes? I'll give three, it to you. Two minutes? Dang it. Okay, all right. All right, go. Do your thing. Do your thing. Okay. All right, two, two minutes, two minutes. Ah oh, man, this is what Mary life is gonna be. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, just stop pulling my shirt off. What are you doing? Okay. All right, guys. I don't have pants on right now when I'm talking to you. So here's uh here's this nice green. Well, I can't pretty really tell it's green. Under the light, it's kind of tannish. But this is supposed to be a green Monty Pora cap. This actually came from um, Shane's or uh, Jim Instagram. <laughs> Can you Telegram on Instagram? What are you doing? By the way, check out the nice ID. one. Okay, you look at this. You my ID like half pages of A4 size. Okay, all right. So this is what Mary Life is gonna be like. Um, so Monty Cap. This Monty Cap actually came from the Baltimore National Aquarium. So it got quite a significant value, uh, a sentimental value at least. And then I mounted it on a frag, uh, frag plug and it used to be one large piece connected to the one in the 45 gallon tank downstairs, but it broke. So I figured I would try the SPS in the 10 gallon tank. To be honest, I mean, it is holding steady. It's not really growing and the color definitely turned more tan. So I don't think it's a success in the 10 gallon tank. It's, it's okay, not totally successful. Um, so we will see. I'll, I'll leave it here for a little bit. If it's still holding steady, I'll probably just kind of move it back to the 45 or just give it away. Now. Coming down here, we got the almost have a dendro. This is a walking dendro. Basically, every day I'll find this little dendro at a different portion of the tank because that's actually a peanut worm that lives underneath it in a hole and it'll drag the whole pile up around and find new places for detritus. Uh, but this guy is fun to watch. It's something a little bit more interactive than this tank. And lastly, sliding over here, we got one of my favorite green tree leather. This is, uh, this is one of my favorite because like in my old tank, a 65 gallon reef tank, which I have not talked about yet, it grew really, really well and looks really nice and have almost like zero maintenance. Uh, so this remain one of the, uh, my favorite soft coral. In the 10 gallon tank, it has not really done too much until recently. I noticed that recently it started growing a little bit more, so I'm really excited to see which way it goes. Oh, actually, lastly, I gotta talk about a frog spawn. So the frog spawn has been doing really well. It has really opened up large. And um, I think it's it's kind of like one of the dominating feature in this tank on tank. And rightfully so. I, I believe every tank needs some frog spawn colony. Actually part of it is close up right now. Like that polyp right there and that polyp right there. Um, we'll see what's going on. We'll see what's going on. You know what, now that I look at this, even if most of the coral seems okay, the fact that the frog spawn is not completely open and the RBTA is moving all, all over the place, I think I'm gonna do another water test just in case. It looks like something may be off besides the water currents. Um, I don't know. I need to check the water temperature as well. We'll see how it goes. And, and then of course I'm gonna... <laughs> I'll be super busy in the following three weeks. So I'm probably gonna leave the tank alone for the most part and leave it on autopilot. Oh, look at that Halloween hermit crab. Yes, that little guy is still alive and well and kicking. And all seven sexy shrimps are still accounted for. But again, I'm gonna leave this tank alone for a while. End of flashback. All right, guys, welcome back. If you actually sat through the whole thing, you are seriously, without a doubt, part of the hardcore reef squad. And I appreciate you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I got a wedding to plan and I will see you guys in a few weeks or on Instagram. DAR Constitution Hall, this is the gallery. Where is it gonna happen? But a good part of it is gonna be outside at the uh, Ponico? Ponico? How do you pronounce it? I don't even know how to pronounce it. 